92.4%. Those were the playoff odds of the Cubs in early September, right before they collapsed. Now, as unfortunate as this collapse was, playoffs were never the expectation heading into the season. Sure, they were one of the offseason's largest spenders and decided against selling at the deadline. But even that was risky given the unlikelihood of them making the playoffs. Nonetheless, right after the deadline, the Red Hot Cubs were on an improbable path towards a playoff berth. Until it all came crashing down. This is the full story of the 2023 Chicago Cubs. Before we move on, I want to thank today's sponsor, Good Chop. Good Chop is an online butcher that offers convenient, contact-free delivery of fully customizable boxes right to your door. And when you go to goodchop.com YouTube and use code STORM120, you get $120 off your first four boxes. Have you ever been to the grocery store and the cut of meat you're looking for isn't in stock? Or the ones that are in stock look Look questionable? Well, Good Chop exclusively sources their products from American farms and fisheries, which are raised responsibly without antibiotics or added hormones. From grass-fed ribeye to wild-caught salmon to thick-cut bacon, there's over 60 high-quality cuts to choose from. Right away, I saw the New York strips and knew I had to cook those first, and they came out amazing. Right after grilling, I ate one steak with rice and veggies, and the following day, I paired the second steak with some eggs. After both meals, the plates were completely empty. Good Chop is so confident you'll love their products that they offer a 100% money back guarantee if you're not fully satisfied. So again, head over to goodchop.com YouTube or click the link in the description and use code STORM120 to get $120 off your first four boxes today. Two balls and a strike. Caratini, center field, hit well. Ortega launches in, it's a three-run walk-off homer! 2022 was a rough year, but it marked a turning point for the new era of Cubs baseball. The vast majority of the 2016 World Series team was long gone, and the remaining members were either declining, or in the case of Wilson Contreras, set to become a free agent. Controversially, Cubs president of baseball operations, Jed Hoyer, decided against trading Contreras due to teams not meeting their asking price. As Hoyer put it, to build the next great Cubs team, seeking prospects for the sake of it isn't always the right move. To be fair, two of the team's most promising prospects were acquired in the trades of Anthony Rizzo and Javier Baez, so the Cubs had a plan on how to build up their top 10 farm system for the long term. But considering they were well under 500 in 2022, at what point did they expect to actually compete? 2-0 pitch, Suzuki gets a hold of one, off the wall and left center and a good ricochet for Seiya, heading for third, they're gonna wave him in! Suzuki heads for home, the throw to the plate, not in time! Japanese star Seiya Suzuki was one of two players to receive a long-term deal from the Cubs ahead of the 2022 season, with the other player being starting pitcher Marcus Stroman. Still, there were many holes to fill on this roster. But with this team possessing the National League's fifth best second half record, the upcoming free agent class was the perfect opportunity to take this rebuild to the next level, particularly at shortstop. Now, as much as Hoyer sought to avoid the types of transactions that prioritize short-term feelings over long-term sustainability, the Cubs had the extremely rare opportunity to sign one of four franchise shortstops. However, the first big signing the Cubs made wasn't a shortstop. It was center fielder and occasional first baseman, Cody Bellinger. Belly wasn't the MVP caliber player he used to be, but he provided elite defense, so even an average offensive season with around 20 home runs would be a success for both parties. Next, they addressed the rotation with the signing of Jamison Tyone to a four-year, $68 million deal. Not quite a DeGrom, Rodon, or Verlander, but Tyone was a consistent pitcher with one of the game's better curveballs and the ability to limit walks. Still, at the same time, the Cubs fans could only watch as some of the big four shortstops started signing with other teams. Were the Cubs really about to let this rare opportunity pass them by? Well, fortunately, they didn't. 
On December 17, 2022, it was announced All-Star and Gold Glover Dansby Swanson had agreed to a seven-year, $177 million deal with the Cubs. The least expensive, but arguably the safest deal among the four shortstops. Swanson's combination of leadership, elite defense, and 20-plus home run pop was exactly what this team wanted in a star player. With the additional signings later in the offseason, the Cubs had committed over $300 million to free agents, the fifth highest amount league-wide. This is without mentioning the three-year extensions of Nico Horner and Ian Happ at the beginning of the regular season. As optimistic as the future looked for the Cubs, 2023 was never projected to be their year. Although, I did find a particularly interesting, bold prediction from ESPN writer David Schoenfield. The Cubs stay in the race until the final week of the season, with the up-the-middle defense playing a key role. Santana down the left field line. That is Despite this bold prediction, the overall consensus was this was set to be a transitory year for the Cubs. But at the same time, there was a more optimistic viewpoint offered by Jed Hoyer. He said that every year, there's always a team that outperforms their projections by 10 plus games. So why not the Cubs? Base hit right field, Dansby Swanson with the knock. And then the throw gets away, here comes the Good defense, good base running, capitalize on mistakes. This was not only how the Cubs won the first game of the season, but this could become the identity of the 2023 Cubs. Let's fast forward to April 10th game number nine of the season. Starter Drew Smiley pitched a solid game, allowing only one earned run in five innings. Originally, he was in line for the win because the Cubs took advantage of a defensive mistake, allowing them to score later on in the inning. Unfortunately, Smiley's win turned into a no decision due to a game-tying ninth inning home run. But this is where it gets interesting. Top of the 10th, JP Crawford attempted to bunt over the Ghost Runner, but a diving catch by Patrick Wisdom prevented that. Then, despite a walk to Julio Rodriguez, Keegan Thompson got out of the inning unscathed. Now, the Cubs had the opportunity to bunt over their Ghost Runner, but that wasn't necessary. An impressive win by the Cubs as they showcased their defense, base running, and ability to capitalize on mistakes. But as impressive as this win was, it was nothing compared to the following game. Now the Mariners have scored in each of the first two innings, and the runs keep on marching home for the Mariners. A run does score. It's a 7-0 Mariners lead. Bellinger going to third, two down, and the batter now is Jan Gomes. 3-2. On the ground up the middle, Juan from the outfield grass, long throw, safe at first, and a run comes in. Center field, that's well struck, Rodriguez back, and it's gone! Round ball right side, base set right field, rounding third, heading home, Bellinger. He will score! It's gonna be one of them nights, I got that feeling. He gets into one, this place will be nuts. 3-1. In the air! Left field! And the Cubs lead! Grand slam, Nelson Velasquez! On the ground, softly hit, Wisdom. And a great stretch at first Mancini ball game. Sure, this was only game number 10. But as Trey Mancini said, wins like this instills a belief that more games like this are soon to come. Well, from their seven run comeback to a five home run game against the Dodgers to their sweep of the athletics, the Cubs started off the season with an unexpected 11 and six record. Everything was going perfectly perhaps a bit too perfectly. Well, after their sweep of the Athletics on April 19th, the Cubs team BABIP, or batting average on balls in play, ranked second league-wide. In short, due to the small sample size, some sort of offensive regression was inevitable. And if there was any sign that luck was turning against the Cubs, look no further than April 21st. 
Peralta, a little number left side, and there won't be a play. That is one of the most awkward hits to ruin a perfect game that you will ever see. This brutal end to a perfect game bid was just the beginning of a rough end to the month as the Cubs barely finished above 500. However, this was nothing compared to what was about to come. Check out this game on May 7th versus the Marlins. The Cubs fell behind early, but some heroics in the bottom of the ninth took this game into extra innings. Although, unlike their game against the Mariners, they couldn't prevent the Marlins from scoring in the top of the 10th. In fact, these two teams traded runs until the 14th inning, where a balk was the game's ultimate decider. Losing to a balk is one thing, but the inability to drive in runners in scoring position was the larger issue. When the Cubs were 11-6, their average OPS and WRC Plus with runners in scoring position ranked top 10 league-wide, while in the subsequent 17 games where they went 6-11, these stats ranked in the bottom 5. The combination of leaving runners on on base and bullpen troubles led to the Cubs going 10 and 18 in May, but they ended up hitting rock bottom on June 8th when they were swept by the Angels. Not only were they 10 games under 500, their record in one run games was the second worst in the league. As Jed Hoyer put it, the story of the season revolved around the inability to perform in high leverage situations. And from a statistical standpoint, he was absolutely right. Now, to be fair to the rotation. The bullpen was the larger issue. Still, arguably the biggest disappointment of the season so far was the Cubs' debut of Jamison Tyone. In fact, he became the sixth starter in Cubs history to have an ERA of seven or higher in his first 10 starts as a Cub. But as easy as it is to overreact or want to make drastic changes, Dansby Swanson told the fans to not overreact, saying all the successful teams he'd been on had the mentality of showing up the next day, continue working, and eventually, things will work out. A base hit could tie it. Mike Tomlin at the plate. Line drive the other way, sink it! Fair ball base hit! And we're tied! On the ground, Anderson picks it up. Line throw! Kicks away! Tomlin in there! Yelich slices that one. Left field half. Ball game! We don't have quitters. That's the message this team sent to the front office heading into the All-Star break. After hitting rock bottom in early June, the Cubs went on to have the sixth best record in the National League between June 9th and the All-Star break, largely thanks to their sudden ability to hit in the clutch. According to Fangraphs' clutch stat, a stat where a score of negative two is considered awful, Cubs hitters flipped the narrative from being terribly unclutch to being among the most clutch. Still, despite the fact two of the team's three All-Stars were pitchers, the pitching staff had a long way to go in terms of performing in high High leverage and clutch situations. At the same time, the Cubs were six and a half games out of a wildcard spot, and the time was running out to prove to the front office it was worth buying at the deadline. Well, the Cubs took this challenge and ran with it. In the air, out to left field, that one back! In the air, center field, Tuckman back, back some more near the ball, and he caught it! What a goal! Oh, yes, he did! Oh, my Holy God! He saved the game, Mike Tuckman, and the Cubs win! With Jed Hoyer showing a willingness to wait until the last minute to decide between buying and selling, Nico Horner said the clubhouse saw this as an opportunity to show who they actually are. By July 29th, the Cubs had won their eighth straight game and were 11-4 following the All-Star break. With their playoff odds tying a season high of 32.4%, along with having the National League's easiest remaining schedule, the front office decided to go for it. So what did they need? Well, this team's offensive success was rooted in their ability to get on base, but this was at the expense of their slugging ability. So on July 31st, they acquired one of the top available bats, switch hitting slugger Jamer Candelario, who was one of the league's top doubles hitters. Also that same day, they added bullpen depth with the acquisition of Jose Quas from the Royals. Now sure, the Cubs could have added more, but on the day of these two trades, the Cubs only had a 24.5% likelihood of making the playoffs. It wasn't the time to trade for stars. Although, with their performance on August 1st, maybe they didn't need a star. Whack, 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 whack. 
My goodness, one swing after another. In the air, left field, sends him back, back some more. Anytime you get a win, put up 20 runs, it's a good day at the ballpark. When a team scores 20 runs, it's easy to overlook the winning pitcher. But at this point, Justin Steele had been overlooked all year. In fact, the only National League starter he trailed in terms of ERA was Blake Snell, someone with a more highlight-worthy pitching style compared to Steele. However, if the Cubs kept winning, not only would Steele's performances play a part in that, he'd have a chance to pitch on a national stage in the postseason. Well, with 55 games left to make up a three and a half game deficit, the Cubs just needed to keep winning to turn this possibility into a reality. 3-2. And the year left field, pretty well struck that one back. On July 17th, the Cubs had a 6% likelihood of making the playoffs. By September 6th, that percentage skyrocketed to 92.4%. How were they doing this? Well, it was clear the Cubs had overcome the struggle of winning close games. Since the All-Star break, this offense became an elite slugging and base running unit with everyone having a role in this success. As for the pitching staff, it was an overall solid unit, but I'd be lying if I said there wasn't some concern. Whether it was Stroman's injury or the below average ERAs from Hendricks and Tyone, clearly this rotation wasn't at full strength. Sure, it was great to see Javier Assad and Jordan Wick step up to the challenge, but all it takes is a couple bad outings to test the depth of this pitching staff. Also, following their sweep of the Giants on September 6th, the Cubs began to showcase a different problem. For example, on September 8th, the Cubs were shut out by the Diamondbacks without getting a runner in scoring position. Then the following day, the Cubs left 10 runners on base, most notably by squandering a bases loaded opportunity in the sixth inning, while the Diamondbacks capitalized on their opportunities later in the game. The Cubs lost three of the four games in this series, losing some ground in the wildcard race as a result. Obviously not ideal, but thankfully their next opponent was the Rockies, and the Cubs won the first game of the series with a clutch ninth inning hit, so they should be able to at least win this series, right? Leans on this ball to deep left center field, and it's going to get out. One, two. Strong three, ball game over. And the inning stays alive for the Rockies. And this ball's driven by Montero to deep left, and it is gone. Yeah, a lot went wrong in this series, and with multiple teams fighting for a wildcard spot, there was no room for failure in these final few weeks. Unfortunately, everything that could have gone wrong, went wrong. Here's the throw! Longo is safe! And that will do it. The Diamondbacks sweep the Cubs. It's a drive to right field by Joshua Palacios. Oh, Brooklyn, baby! Clear the deck with a huge pinch hit cannonball. On September 14th, the Cubs had an 81.1% likelihood of making the playoffs. By September 21st, this number plummeted to 32.4% as they were clinging on to the final wildcard spot. Since September 7th, this team's ability to perform in high leverage situations dwindled away, and as Dansby Swanson said after their final loss to the Pirates, sometimes a big hit in certain moments is what makes all the difference. Fortunately, these problems were alleviated in in their sweep of the Rockies, but their final two opponents, the Braves and Brewers, were far superior teams. With only a one game lead for the final wildcard spot, this team's playoff hopes were entirely dependent on these final six games. Shallow right center, but it hangs up in the air. Oh, Right side, it will score a run. Oh, everybody safe! A critical error again at the worst time for the Chicago Cubs.
With this Marlins win, the Cubs collapse was complete. It's easy to place blame on a singular mistake, but as manager David Ross said after Suzuki's error, we're not going to highlight one mistake. We could have scored more runs, we could have made some pitches earlier in the game, but we didn't. In fact, after the walk-off loss to the Braves, the Cubs had lost five games in September after holding a lead in the eighth inning or later, tying the record for the most such losses in a single month over the past 50 seasons. From the costly errors, to the inability to hold a lead, to the injuries and fatigue, it just wasn't the Cubs' year. Now, at the same time, it was never meant to be their year. They didn't quite meet Jed Hoyer's goal of outperforming projections by at least 10 wins, but overall, this team proved those projections wrong. In fact, in terms of expected record, which is based on runs scored and runs allowed, the Cubs won seven less games than expected, the third largest negative difference of the season. Now, I'm not saying the Cubs should have been a 90-win team, but this does show they're trending in the right direction, and that's ignoring the fact that they currently have MLB Pipeline's fourth highest rated farm system. Still, this offseason will feature many decisions that will shape the future of this franchise. Currently, the Cubs have a solid core of hitters locked up for the long term, but will they add Cody Bellinger to this group? His asking price won't be cheap, and this is without addressing the need for more power in the lineup. As for the pitching staff, there's less certainty on who will be on the team in 2024. So, with the emergence of Justin Steele as the staff ace, along with the bullpen's role in the September collapse, pitching depth should be a main priority. However, don't count out the possibility of signing or trading for another top starter. Overall, it was a disappointing end to the season. But as Jan Gomes said, it was a big deal for this team to create a winning culture, and that's exactly what they did. The future is bright on Chicago's north side, and I'm very intrigued to see what they do next. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, leave a like if you did, and subscribe for more content just like this. Thanks for watching.